Hello, everyone. My name is Tim Webb, and I'm the founder of the Texas Leadership Summit. And today I want to thank you for being with me as we walk through this podcast today. I've um, got some things that I want to address with uh, involving courage and uh, what is it and where do we get it? How do we maintain it? How do we grow it? How do we actually implement this uh, courage that we've been talking about for the church to stand for their faith, having the courage to do that. Before we begin, I want to remind you, if you have any questions about the Texas Leadership Summit, please check out our website at texasleadershipsummit.org. Uh, we are getting uh, ready for our October uh, summit experience. Uh, you can see that online and check out uh, what's coming your way. We are also excited about how different uh, leaders are being developed and grown at the local level in the pillars of church, education, government, and business. Our desire is to empower the everyday leader with courage, hope, and tools to ignite, ignite a revival of Christian leadership, especially at the local level. We are engaging in relationships, collaborating with uh, Moms for America, other groups such as Remnant Alliance. It is uh, desired to bring pastors together all across our country. And how can we do that? How can we encourage the, the pastors at the local level? Also, Citizens Defending Freedom. We've got Recover America. We've got different organizations uh, that can equip uh, people in the church brothers and sisters in the faith at the local level. If we can get just 10% of everyday leaders at the local level to engage their faith, we know that God's word has the power to transform whole communities. But we've got to step forward in our faith, standing for our faith, with our faith, having the courage to do so. So with that, I want to ask you just a couple of questions today. Uh, and these just come out of seeing where we are today with our our nation, from uh, the national level of leadership all the way down to the local, we find ourselves in a situation where it's, it's no longer about left versus right, uh, Republican against Democrat or Democrat against Republican. It, it, for the church, it is an issue of will we stand against evil? Will we love our brothers and sisters enough? Will we love our communities enough to stand firm and confront evil in our communities. Now, we know that first and foremost, we need to be about the gospel. We need to be sharing the gospel within our communities because that is where it all begins. That's where it began with me, it began with you. It is the gospel engaging and impacting whole lives. And so with salvation. So we know it begins there, but then as the church move, moves forward in the faith, we have the ability to be transformed and, and bring about just solutions that offer whole communities an opportunity to experience the life in which God designed us to. So with that, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you most interested in your story? Is that the emphasis every day when you wake up? Is your whole interest mostly in your story? What's happening to you? What's happened to you? What is happening and what is going to happen? Is that your uh, is that drives everything you do every day. Or, as some of us are finding, not only is it just about our story, but America's story. Some people are so devastated by what they see happening in America that they're mostly interested in what's going to happen to our country. They're more interested in the story of America. Now, when we talk about courage, if it's about your story or America's story, you're going to be very limited with the amount of courage that you have to keep standing in the fight. But if you're most interested about God's story, there you're going to be able to tap into a courage that is beyond your comprehension. You're going to be able to tap into a strength and a courage that comes from knowing Christ and being in a relationship in the body of Christ. And we can have courage that we see in the uh, old saints of old, in the Old Testament, uh, in the New Testament, in the early church, we see this courage being lived out. Uh, why is it that when we're interested in God's story the most, that we're able to have this incredible courage to do what is right, even at the expense and cost of our lives? Well, it's because our hope is not in us. Our hope is not found in our country. Our hope is found in in Jesus Christ. And so who he is and what he has done and what he's going to do. So with that, 
I, I want to share a, a, just a couple of passages with you, because if it's about God's story, what do we know? What do we know from Genesis to Revelation? Who is it about? It's about God. We know that he is the hero of the story, and we know there was a problem. His image bearers rebelled and sinned against him. And so what would he do to fix the problem? Well, he would send his son. Uh, Jesus the Christ would atone for that sin. And what we see in the beginning of the story is that God, when he confronts Adam and Eve in their rebellion uh, and their sin, and he confronts the serpent, we see right there in Genesis 3, the first pointing to the gospel, where the head of uh, the the son would crush the head of the serpent. And we see that in Genesis 3. We see where God the Father would place enmity uh, between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And we see this being lived out in the story, all through the story. It began with Cain and Abel. We see it being lived out right there in chapter 4 and moving on. And so the saints of old would be looking forward to this, this brother who would die would atone for sins, one who was not deserving of death, but would die to atone for the sins of others. And so we see this, this enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman uh, in the scriptures. We see them looking forward to the, the son, uh, the Messiah who would come. And we see this being uh, lived out through God creating this nation of Israel through Abraham, their father. We see this being played out in scripture, creating a nation with a law and gaining a land. But we see that they would forsake their God. They would rebel against their God. And uh, out of their rebellion, they would be removed from the land. They would fall under judgment. Now, this Messiah would come. He would be crucified. He would die for their sins. And in their rejection, the gospel then would go out into the world, to the Gentiles. The Gentiles would believe, and this was all designed by the Father to then make Israel jealous and then one day repent, return to the Lord and be saved from their sin. And so we see at the return of the Son, we believe as a church that he was crucified, buried, resurrected, and sent to the right hand of the Father, but one day he will come again establish his throne here on earth. And we know that we will not remain in heaven. Those who died, we will not remain in heaven forever. We see in Revelation where there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And we will live in that new earth with Christ. And there will be no need for a son, for the glory of God will illuminate this new earth, this new heaven and earth. And so uh, with this in God's story, we see in Psalm 2 the situation that we find ourselves in. We see in Psalm 2 where the psalmist is asking this questions. This question, why are the nations in an uproar and peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Uh, the nations making their stand against the Lord's anointed. We saw this uh, at uh, the crucifixion of Christ where the religious leaders there in Israel, in Jerusalem specifically, took their stand against the Lord's anointed. His son stood with the Romans and had him crucified. The psalmist goes on, he says, and this is from the father's perspective and the son's following. Uh, in the verses, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. And then the son replies in verse seven, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. We see this in John's gospel, this language, I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. This is going to be fulfilled at the return of Christ. The nations have taken their stand uh, at the first coming of Christ against the Lord's anointed, his son. And then at the return of Christ, we see in scripture where they will make their stand once again against the Christ. And the scriptures in Psalm 2 says that he will shatter them like earthenware. And so uh, this does not present to us in Psalm 2 
uh, this suffering lamb, if you will. We see uh, this son of God, majestic, holy, this king of king, kings and lord of lords, Psalm 110. We see him returning and bringing judgment with him. Now, there's a warning that follows these verses in verse 10 through 12. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage. Why would they need to rejoice with trembling? Well, he tells us, do homage to the son. Literally, kiss the feet of the son. That he not become angry and you perish in the way. Where have we heard? Where have we read this in the New Testament? John three sixteen. Uh, everyone's on the road to perishing. We stop at verse sixteen, but seventeen and eighteen uh, tell us that those who reject the Son, you already have the wrath of God upon you. It, it resides over you. You deserve it. We are all on the road to perishing. But how do we escape that perishing? Well, we see that in John three sixteen, uh, but we see it also here in Psalm uh, two verse twelve where he says, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him, exclamation point. And that's the key. We take refuge in the son. The saints of old were looking forward to the coming of the son. We in the New Testament era, looking back, we take refuge in the son by placing our faith in Christ. Jesus is the Christ. He died for our sins, the penalty of our sins. He was buried and resurrected, ascended to the right hand of the Father. We believe that one day he's going to return and save us from the presence of sin and the power of sin, ultimately. And we will be able to be true image bearers of the Father. And so basically it's enabling us through faith in Christ to one day experience that garden living to its fullest. And so we escape the wrath of God by placing our refuge in the Son of God. And so with this, we talk about courage. Uh, If I am about God's story, I'm about his son. And my refuge is found in the son. And my hope is in his son, Jesus the Christ, who he is and what he's done. And one day, what he's going to do. I am looking forward to the resurrection. Here's the key for courage. My hope is not in the here and now. Now, by having faith in the son, I'm a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to do what is right in his eyes. I want to honor the Christ. I want to honor the head of the church. I want to live a life of transformation, yielding myself to his word, allowing his word to drive and dictate what I believe and how I live, giving me right thinking so that I can give a right response, doing what is right in God's eyes and not my own. And see, there's the problem today. We have many people are doing what is right in their own eyes. And I'm talking about the church. I'm not surprised when lost people act lost. I'm surprised when the church responds to life by doing what is right in their own eyes, becoming like the world instead of doing what is right in God's eyes and following through with obedience. Now, this courage that we're talking about, it comes from placing our faith in the Son in his resurrection to come, that as he was resurrected, we too shall be resurrected. You see it in Hebrews chapter 11. They didn't experience it in their lifetime. Um, It was what they were looking forward to, the resurrection. It would be after their death. One day that resurrection would come to them as promised to them. Now, let me ask you another question. So is God, why, why should we why should we know his word and, and why should we be interested in his story? And, and why should we be concerned about him keeping his promises? Is he going to keep his promises to Israel? You bet. If he wasn't willing to keep his promises to Israel, then what's to give you the courage and the hope that he'll keep his promises for you and the resurrection to come? The answer is found in Scripture. If God is faithful, he cannot deny himself. That is who he is. He is a faithful God. He is going to be faithful to Israel. He's going to restore Israel one day. We are in the age of the Gentiles. In the here and now, what are we to be about? We're to be about our faith. We're about 
the word transforming our lives and, and preaching and teaching and sharing the gospel so that others can come to Christ. And through this, our prayers that Israel, according to Isaiah, would become jealous and repent and return to the Lord. That's our prayer for Israel, that they would repent and return to the Lord and that Christ in return uh, would make everything right. That he will deal with evil. He will deal with Satan. He will deal with the enemy. And he will deal with death. In the meantime, we stand firm in our faith. That's what we do. We have courage. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the willingness to do what is right, even in the midst of fear, knowing that it may cost our lives. This obedience that God requires of us. And we do it with joy. We do it with gladness of heart. And so as we are moving forward uh, through TLS and our relationships with other groups and organizations that are about equipping God's people to stand for their faith, to have the courage to stand to do what is right, uh, we want other people to, we want to do it in such a way that the gospel is presented, that people are being saved, that whole communities are being transformed. We are not doing this out of hate and anger and malice and threatening uh, or being judgmental. We're doing it out of love. Because we love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and we love others as he has loved us. And so with that, um, my prayer is that you will be mostly interested in God's story. Know his word so that we can be the church. And now, again, I want to remind you, go to teachmethebible.org if you want to know more about this story, God's story in detail and connecting the dots from Genesis to Revelation. It's been a great opportunity to be a part of that. I'm looking forward to what's going to come through that as well and that uh, collaboration um, and these other groups that we're joining with. Uh, church, brothers and sisters in the faith, we may come from different walks of life, but if we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ alone, the faith alone in him, we're in the body of Christ. We're in the same family. It's time for us to come together and start sharing what we're standing for and not just what we're standing against. But who are we for? So I pray that you're blessed for this today. Looking forward to getting into more conversations in the future on the podcast. I'd like for us the next time to be looking at passages that we take out of context and apply to us for today that were not meant for us to apply in our everyday lives or apply for America. They were for Israel. And so how do we address Scripture? How do we look at the context of Scripture? How do we apply it to our lives so that we can, again, gain uh, more courage and be able to stand firm in our faith and just shore us up uh, to, to stand firm? That's what Paul would say. Uh, stand firm. Be strong. Peter would say that as well. So thank you for your time today. Check out our website, TexasLeadershipSummit.org. Get ready for our summit in October. And I look forward to seeing you again on future podcasts. God bless.